let's get right into it. Number 10. Pain treatment with electric fish. Picture this. You're in ancient Rome and have the worst headache of your life. Your local healer shows up with a live fish and says, let me put this on your head. Before you can object, you're getting zapped by a natural taser. These weren't just any fish. They were electric rays and Nile catfish. They could generate enough electricity to give you a decent shock. And surprisingly, these shocks actually helped with pain. There's this story about a guy named Anteros, a freed Roman slave. He accidentally stepped on an electric ray at the beach and got zapped. But after the shock wore off, his gout pain was gone. This caught the attention of Scribonius Largus, Emperor Claudius's personal doctor. He started prescribing fish therapy to his patients. They were using basically the same idea as modern TENS therapy. Number 9. Goat's liver for night blindness. You're in ancient Egypt and can't see a thing after sunset, basically blind in darkness, stumbling around helplessly. Then your local healer shows up with a fresh goat's liver. These ancient doctors had a two-step process. First, they'd roast the liver and collect the oil that dripped out. They'd rub this oil around your eyes, which probably felt as gross as it sounds. Then came the fun part. You had to eat the rest of the liver, and it actually worked. Turns out goat's liver is packed with vitamin A, which your eyes need to see in the dark. These healers were basically prescribing vitamins thousands of years before vitamins were discovered. The treatment spread across cultures and continents. From Egyptian papyrus scrolls to Greek medical texts, everyone was writing about the magic of goat's liver. Number 8. Setting broken bones with splints. Alright, you're in ancient Egypt again and have a broken arm. And here comes your healer with tree bark and grass this time. Now, you're probably thinking this guy's lost his mind, but these ancient bone setters knew exactly what they were doing. First, they'd carefully move the broken pieces back into place by feel, like putting together a puzzle blindfolded. This was the part where you'd probably want to bite down on something, because pain medication wasn't really a thing yet. Then they'd take strips of bark, usually from palm trees, and wrap them around the break. They'd pat it with grass and secure everything with linen bandages. Sometimes they'd add herbal creams between the layers to help with swelling and pain. When archaeologists examine ancient Egyptian bones, they find breaks that healed perfectly straight. These guys were basically running ancient emergency rooms with nothing but plants and cloth. In England, there was this famous bone setter nicknamed Crazy Sally. She could fix bones that university-trained doctors couldn't. People traveled from all over just to see her, despite the nickname. These techniques were so effective they spread across the world. Some traditional bone setters in places like Nigeria still use similar methods today. The basic principle hasn't changed. We've just upgraded from tree bark to plastic and metal. Number 7. Willow bark as pain reliever. So, your skull feels like it's splitting in half in ancient times. The healer rummages through their bag and pulls out some tree bark. They tell you to chew on it like a beaver. And honestly, the pain's so bad you'd chew on a sandal if you knew it would help. Well, this is willow bark, and it contains something called salicin. That's the same stuff we use today to make aspirin. These ancient doctors didn't know the chemistry, but they knew it worked. The Sumerians were using it over 3,500 years ago. They'd brew it into tea, chew it raw, or make warm packs from the leaves. Sure, it tasted absolutely terrible, but when you're in pain, you'll try anything. It wasn't until the 1820s that Italian scientists finally figured out why it worked. They isolated salicin from the bark, which German chemists later turned into aspirin. Number 6. Opium poppy for pain relief. The Sumerians called the opium poppy the joy plant in their medical texts. Ancient doctors would cut tiny lines in the seed pod and collect the white sap that oozed out. They'd dry this sap until it turned dark and sticky, then mix it with honey to make it taste better. Egyptian mothers would use it to help calm crying babies during weaning. Talk about starting them young. Roman doctors would give it to patients before surgery because anesthesia wasn't a thing yet. The Romans loved this stuff so much they put it on their coins, but they knew it was dangerous too. Ancient doctors wrote warnings about using too much, like ancient drug labels. So yeah, they didn't know about morphine or codeine, but they knew this plant could make the pain go away, though sometimes it made the patient go away too, if they weren't careful with the dose. Number 5. Moldy Bread for Wound Treatment Here's the scene. Ancient Egypt, nasty infected wound. Your healer arrives carrying what looks like garbage. It's actually moldy bread, though. Next thing you know, they're slapping that fuzzy bread right on your wound. But here's the crazy part. It actually worked. The famous Egyptian healer Imhotep was doing this way back in 2600 BC. He was so good at healing people with moldy bread that they literally made him a god after he died. 
And it wasn't just Egypt getting creative with expired food. Ancient doctors in Greece, China, and even Australian aboriginals were all using similar mold treatments. They'd slap some moldy stuff on wounds and watch the infections disappear. Fast forward to 1928, and Alexander Fleming discovers penicillin from a similar type of mold. Turns out those ancient doctors were basically using nature's antibiotics thousands of years before we figured out what antibiotics even were. Number 4. Cauterization Now you're in a medieval battlefield, and your wound won't stop bleeding. Your doctor pulls out a red-hot iron rod and says, This is gonna hurt. They'd heat up metal tools until they glowed red, then press them against wounds to seal them shut. It wasn't just about stopping bleeding. The intense heat killed bacteria, too. In 2018, scientists found something wild in an Italian saint's mummy from the 11th century. His body showed clear signs of careful cauterization, perfectly placed burn marks from medical treatment. These weren't random burns. They were precisely planned surgical procedures. Medieval Arab doctors loved this technique, too. They had special tools just for burning different parts of the body. Each tool would get stained black from repeated use, marking how many lives it had saved, and probably how many it hadn't. Today, we still use cauterization, just with fancy electric tools instead of hot irons. Number 3. Ant Mandible Sutures Picture yourself as a soldier in ancient India, with a nasty gash that needs stitching. No needle, no thread, just you in the jungle around you. That's where these little guys come in. Ants with jaws so strong they can literally stitch wounds together. The medic would grab a big ant by its body and place it near your wound. The ant, being naturally defensive, would bite down hard, gripping both sides of the cut. Then they'd twist off the ant's body, leaving just the head with its jaws locked in place. It's like a natural version of surgical staples. And these weren't just holding wounds together. Their saliva had antimicrobial properties. So while they're clamping your wound closed they're also fighting off infection. Different cultures use different species. Indian doctors preferred weaver ants, African tribes used driver ants, and South American healers went for army ants. This technique was documented in ancient medical texts from 1000 BC. It was so effective that doctors kept using it for thousands of years. Some indigenous tribes still practice this method today. Number 2. Artemisia annua as malaria treatment. Picture yourself in ancient China. You got a fever that comes and goes like an unwanted house guest. Your healer arrives with leaves that look like they belong in a salad. But these aren't just any leaves. This is Artemisia annua, also called sweet wormwood. The ancient Chinese had a weird way of preparing it. They'd soak the fresh leaves, then wring them out by hand like a wet towel. Sometimes they'd even soak them in urine instead of water. This strange method actually worked better than modern techniques. That hand wringing gets 20 times more medicine out than fancy lab equipment. The plant contains artemisinin, which kills malaria parasites like nothing else. During the Vietnam War, scientists rediscovered these ancient texts. They were desperately looking for new malaria treatments because the old ones weren't working anymore. What they found in those dusty pages ended up saving millions of lives. Today, artemisinin-based drugs are the world's best weapon against malaria. In places where people grow and use this plant the traditional way, malaria rates have dropped dramatically. Number 1. Variolation. So, you're a villager in ancient China, and smallpox is tearing through your village like wildfire. Your healer says, let me blow some crushed smallpox scabs up your nose. They'd take dried scabs from someone with a mild case of smallpox, grind them into powder, and blast them up your nose with a special pipe. Boys got it in the right nostril, girls in the left. Don't ask why. Nobody knows. But it actually worked. While regular smallpox killed about 30% of people who caught it, this nose powder method only killed 1-2%. to Those are pretty good odds when your other option is watching half your village die. The practice spread across Asia, then to Europe thanks to Lady Mary Montague. She saw Turkish doctors doing it and brought it back to England. In America, they learned about it from an enslaved man named Onesimus during Boston's 1721 epidemic. He taught Cotton Mather about it, saving countless lives. The guy who helped save America from smallpox wasn't even allowed to be free. This was basically the great-grandfather of modern vaccines. That's all for today. I'll be making similar videos in the future. Subscribe to see them.